The next lesson we're going to cover is lesson 2.4. It has two primary objectives that are going to build off the objectives we had in lesson 2.3, and that is to find the real zeros of a polynomial function and to find the complex zeros of polynomial functions. So those are our two different objectives. We're going to concentrate just for today on the real zeros of polynomial functions. So it's the search for zeros, which is, in other words, we're searching for where our polynomial function crosses the x-axis. There are two types of real zeros that they want to point out in this first chart, and that is the stuff about rational zeros and also irrational zeros. They're both real zeros. They're both places where our graph will cross the x-axis. The only difference is we're a little more comfortable with the rational zeros. Those are our numbers that are, um, as the example is given here, uh, negative 3 is a rational number. Integers, uh, any fractions, any uh, fractions that can be written as a ratio of two integers, ratio, rational is a ratio of two integers, 2 over 3. If we have solutions like this, they're called rational zeros. The ones that are irrational zeros, we haven't really dealt with much at all yet, but we're going to get into that. And that is when we have a factorization of x squared minus 5, or a polynomial of x squared minus 5, which factors into x plus the square root of 5, x minus the square root of 5. And you can see that our square roots are our irrational. So there's two different types we're going to be searching for that are real. The real zeros are either rational or irrational. Today we're going to concentrate on rational zeros. The rational zero theorem describes how the leading coefficient, the constant term of the polynomial, with integer coefficients can help you find a list of possible rational zeros. Um, to kind of fit this in with what the last lesson was, in lesson 2.3, they gave you a polynomial function, and then they put after that polynomial functions uh, a linear factor, and they said, is this linear factor a zero of the function? And then we go through our synthetic division. If we got a remainder of zero, it was a factor. If it wasn't a zero, then it was not a factor, and we just moved on from there. So what we're doing differently in this lesson is they're not going to give you those linear uh, possibilities. They're not going to give you those to try. We have to come up with that list on our own. And that's what this rational zero theorem is all about. This rational zero theorem tells us how can we find any possible rational zero or x-intercept of our graph. And this is kind of mathy in here, but it says as long as it's a polynomial function with the form of, and then they give you this long form. Well, in this form, what we want to make sure is, is that um, our coefficients are going to be constants. So they're saying integer coefficients. An a sub 0 is not equal to 0. That means this last, the constant, we don't want that to be equal to 0. If it's equal to 0, we cannot use this rational 0 theorem. And every rational 0 has the form of p over q. So let me describe that a little bit further coming down here. We're going to look at an example. Um, we're going to find a list of all possible rational zeros of each function, and we're going to use this concept of the rational zero theorem to help us build that list. When you look at the p and the q, um, what they're talking about is p is an integer factor of the constant term, and q is an integer factor of the leading coefficient term. And this p over q just means then what we can interpret as list all your factors of the constant on the top of your fraction, list all of your factors of the leading coefficient. So I'll put LC, leading coefficient, on the bottom. If you write the ratio of all these as a plus and a minus value of this fraction, P over Q, these are your entire list of every possible rational zero. Okay, so what does it do? It helps us build a list of an exhaustive list of where our graph can cross the x-axis or become a zero of the function. So we're going to put, put this into practice. In our first example, um, f at x equals x cubed plus 5x squared minus 4x minus 2. Our job is to find the rational zeros. We're going to use our rational zero theorem to help us figure out what are the possible rational zeros. So what we look at then are the factors of the constant divided by the factors of the leading coefficient. Now, if you look in this first one, it says your leading coefficient is equal to 1. That's going to dramatically decrease the number of possibilities that we'll try. But here's what we're looking at. Here's our constant. It's a 2. Our leading coefficient is 1. So what are all the factors of the constant? Well, the only factors of 2 are 1 and 2. So we always put plus and minus. We're going to try both the positive and the negative factors of 2. 
And on the bottom, what's the factor of our leading coefficient? Since our leading coefficient is 1, the only factors are plus and minus 1. Now what this does, it creates an exhaustive list of all the possible rational zeros of this function. So if I start doing this and compiling a list, I'm really taking a positive 1 divided by a positive 1, which is 1. I'm taking a positive 2 divided by a positive 1, which is 2. I'm going to take a negative 1 divided by a positive 1, which is a negative 1. So to shorthand this, I can probably just simplify it further by saying, if I take a positive 1 or negative 1 divided by a positive 1 or negative 1, I'm going to get a plus or minus 1. Those are my possibilities. Then I'm going to do the same thing with this. Take a positive 2 divided by a positive 1, it's 2. Take a positive 1 divided by a negative, or positive 2 divided by a negative 1, it's a negative 2, and vice versa. We're only going to get plus or minus 2. What these are, are possible zeros. So now we're going to use the knowledge that we took from lesson 2.3, and that is, if these are zeros of the function, then if we use synthetic division, then we would get an answer or a remainder of 0. So we're going to combine a lot of information here into the search for zeros. So we're going to use our synthetic division. We're going to pull out the coefficients of each one of these terms. So I'm going to write down a 1, a 5, a negative 4, and a negative 2. We think that we've made a list of possible real zeros. Our list includes a plus and minus 1 and a plus and minus 2. So it's a matter of trial and error and elimination. Um, I'm going to put a 1 in here, draw the line, and we're going to see, um, we're going to go through our synthetic division. Drop down your 1. 1 times 1 is 1. Add it to 5, that's a 6. 1 times 6 is 6. Add it to a negative 4, which is 2. 1 times 2 is 2. Add it to a negative 2, it is 0. If we get a remainder of 0, which we just did, we now know that a positive 1 is a zero of the function. If positive 1 is a zero of the function, then we also know um, positive 1 is a zero. We also know something about its related factor, which means x minus 1 is the factor. I'm just trying to draw that back into your attention. Um, there's a close relationship between the zeros and the factors. Now, they want to know what if there are any zeros, what are they? And positive 1 is a zero. So positive 1 and 1 went in there evenly. So we started with an x to the third. So this has to be an x squared. Since we already took out one real, we could look at this and see if this factors. Um, our 1 is 1x squared plus 6x plus 2. If you look at this, I don't think it's going to take us very long to figure out that this is not going to factor. So. We, once you get it down to quadratic, we can use our factoring techniques to see if it's going to factor any farther and if we can be any more productive in our search for rational zeros. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you what's going to happen if you keep searching for zeros um, using your rational zero theorem. We found one at positive 1. Now let's try negative 1. Now you notice I'm not going back to the original equation. If you get a remainder of 0, go ahead and use your depressed equation and use your synthetic division after that. So I bring down the 1. Negative 1 times 1 is a negative 1. 6 and a negative 1 is a 5. 1 times a negative 5 is a negative 5. And negative 5 plus 2 is a negative 3. This is not a remainder of 0. So what does it tell me? It tells me I can eliminate a negative 1 from my search for a real 0. It's not. So since that one was not, then what I can do is I can come back up and I can try the plus and minus 2. Now there is another method of doing that as well, but I'm just going to erase this. And I'm going to come back, and instead of putting a negative 1, I'm going to put in a positive 2. And remember, we already know that there aren't any factors here. I'm just demonstrating that. If you keep following through with your synthetic division, you will not get a remainder of 0. So 2 times 1 is 2. 6 and 2 is 8. 2 and 8 is 16. 16 and 2 is 18. It's not a 0, therefore... 2 is not a 0 of the function. So the only other one I could try that's in my list for my rational 0 theorem is um, a negative 2. So draw the line, bring down your 1. Negative 2 times 1 is a negative 2. 6 and negative 2 is 4. Negative 2 times 4 is a negative 8. A negative 8 and 2 is a negative 6. Not a remainder of 0, therefore negative 2 is not a 0 of the function. So in our entire list that we looked at, the only one that ended up being a 0 was a positive 1. And we could verify that through the use of our synthetic division. We got a remainder of 0. Then, as I said, the shortcut to that is once you have it as a quadratic, stop using your synthetic division and start using your factoring techniques. 
If you can't factor it, I suppose you could use a quadratic formula, but if we can't factor it, it's not going to be a rational zero. Those, those will end up being irrational. So there's the first go around of using the rational zero theorem along with synthetic division to find or to locate a zero of the function, which also helps us factor it as uh, linear factors as well. So we'll go to the next example. In our next example, it's a 4-3 polynomial. Um, and we're going to state all the possible rational zeros. The rational zero the theorem says take your factors of your constant and divide them by the factors of your leading coefficient. Well, the constant is 30. What are all the possible factors of 30? Then you can go plus or minus 1, so it's 1 times 30. 2 times 15, we can do 3 times 10. Uh, 4 doesn't go in there evenly, but 5 goes in there evenly, 6 times. And now, when these numbers merge in the middle, when I get a 5 and a 6, I know there are no more uh, to search for. But 3 got matched up with plus or minus 10. The 2 got matched up with plus or minus 15. And the 1 gets matched up with plus or minus 30. So it gets to be kind of a long list. On the bottom, factors of the leading coefficient. The leading coefficient is 1, so it's just plus or minus a 1. So you're going to figure this out, but whenever you divide by a plus or minus 1, your list of these factors never change. All we got to use is the factors of our constant. So here's the ones that we're going to try. Of all the numbers in the universe, we've made, we've made this list a lot shorter, even though it seems pretty long. This at least gives us an idea of where to start. So we're going to try to use these possible factors with synthetic division to help us determine whether or not there are zeros of the function. So, synthetic division. You pull out your 1, your 3, your negative 7, a 9, negative 30. You want to divide it synthetically by your possible rational zeros. The first time through, maybe I'll try a positive 1. So, when we try a positive 1, we drop down our 1. 1 times 1 is 1. Add it to 3, which is a 4. 1 times 4 is 4. Add it to a negative 7, which is a negative 3. 1 times a negative 3 is a negative 3. Add it to 9, which is a 6. 1 times 6 is 6. We add it to a negative 30 is a negative 24. This is not 0. Therefore, we can cross out a positive 1 off our list. It is not going to be a 0. Okay, so then you can start back over. You could write a new line. And this is where we want maybe to adopt a little different theme on how we're going to organize our synthetic division. So I'm going to try to... Okay, because you're going to be doing this multiple times, what we want to do is we want to maybe devise a little different way of doing the synthetic division so we don't have to erase or start over every time. So this time I'm going to try the negative 1. So negative 1. We're going to carry more of this in our head, but we always bring down our first number. Now it's a negative 1 times 1, which is negative 1. Now we just mentally add that to 3. 3 and a negative 1 is 2. Just write down your 2. Negative 1 times 2 is a negative 2. Add that to a negative 7. That's a negative 9. Negative 1 times negative 9 is a positive 9. 9 plus 9 is 18. Negative 1 times 18 is a negative 18. If I add that to a negative 30, do I get 0? No, that's, that's absolutely not. So that one doesn't work. So then we're going to try a positive 2. Now, this line was not right. We're always going to keep coming back up to this line up here. So maybe you want to put it in a box or something so you know which one you want to use. But I'm going to drop down the 1. 2 times 1 is 2. Add to 3, which is 5. 2 times 5 is 10. Add it to the negative 7, which is 3. 2 times 3 is 6. Add it to 9, which is 15. 2 times 15 is 30. Add it to a negative 30, and we get a remainder of 0. Okay, now that's the one that we want. If it's remainder of 0, we now know that plus 2 is a factor. We want to keep that in mind. So this was a 4th degree polynomial. So now I know I have it down to a 3rd degree polynomial. I don't have any factoring techniques for 3rd degree polynomials. So I have to consider or continue doing the synthetic division. But now what I'm going to use is the depressed model. This cubic function. I'm going to try the rest of my um, leading code or combinations here. Now just because 2 was a factor doesn't mean it couldn't be a factor again. It couldn't be a multiplicity 
on the factor of two or the zero two. I doubt they introduced that right now, but what, what we should try is try the two again. Again, I'm saying it might be a multiple root. It could be tangent there. So this positive two could possibly go back into these numbers of our depressed. So that's what the first thing I'm going to try. Bring down the one. Two times one is two. Two plus five is seven. Two times seven is 14. 14 and three is 17. Two times 17 is 34. When I add these, I definitely do not get a remainder of zero. So it is not a multiple root. So now I can move on to the next possibility. The next possibility would be a negative two. So I'm going to try a negative two. I'm going to go back to this one in blue. That's my depressed. This one, this one didn't work. So I don't know. Sometimes I've seen people go like that. So they don't get confused. But I'm going to work off the one. Negative two times one is a negative two. Negative two plus five is three. Negative two times three is a negative six. Negative six plus three is a negative three. Negative two times negative three is six. Six and 15 is, uh, I'm gonna make sure I did that. Six and, all of a sudden I lost my train of thought. Sorry, here we go. It's a negative two times a negative three, which is a six. Six plus 15 is 21, not a remainder of zero. So that means negative two is not a zero of a function. We have to go through and we have to test every one of these numbers in the list. And I'm going to test a three. So we're down to this spot, spot in our line. So again, going back up to the one circled in blue. This one not, did not work. So drop down your one. Three times one is three. Three plus five is eight. Three times eight is 24. 24 plus three is 27. Three times 27. Well, I don't really have to multiply that together because I know if I add it to 15 it will not be 0 but that is 21 carry the 2 uh, make sure I'm doing that right that should be 81 81 and 15 it's definitely not a 0 so I'm not even going to consider that move on next one I can try is a negative 3 negative 3 is another possibility going off my blue circled uh, or my blue box Bring down your one. Negative three times one is negative three. Negative three plus five is a negative. Negative three plus five is a two. Negative three times two is a negative six. Negative six plus three is a negative three. Negative three times a negative three is nine. Nine plus fifteen. Whatever it is, I know it's not zero, so forget about it. I don't need a negative three either. Okay, so then we're going to go up and we're going to try another one, plus or minus five. So my next one is five. Put five. Put your inverted box. Remember working off the blue box. Bring down your one. Five times one is five. Five plus five is ten. Five times ten is fifty. Fifty plus three is fifty-three. Fifty-three times five plus fifteen is not zero. Forget about five. Try negative five. So bring down your one. Negative five times one is a negative five. Negative five and zero is zero. Negative five times zero is zero. Zero plus three is three. Negative 5 times 3 is a negative 15. Negative 15 and 15 is 0. Okay, we just found our other 0. This was a third degree polynomial, which means the remaining one is a second degree polynomial. So once we get it down to a second, you can see why we don't want to keep continuing to do this. We've got several other possibilities to do. But what we have is an x squared plus 0x, if you want, plus 3. Or it's x squared plus 3. And that's my last one. That's my depressed equation. If we think of this as a quadratic, can we ever find where this is equal to zero? Well, if we do, that means x squared is equal to a negative three. That means x is equal to plus or minus the square root of a negative three. And we can immediately notice that this will not be a real solution. So we're done finding our real rational roots. The only roots that we had were we had a positive two that came out. We had a positive or a negative five that came out. So, in our search for rational zeros, positive two and negative five were the ones that washed out. All the others will not, will not work. So that's the method of finding zeros using your rational zero theorem um, in in synthetic division.